the sacred assembly of the Feast of Unleavened Bread has come. Today, let us take some time to reflect on the meaning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread under the sermon titled, The Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passion. About 3,500 years ago, in the time of Moses, God appointed the Feast of Unleavened Bread when the Israelites left Egypt and were on their way to the land of Canaan, flowing with milk and honey. The Bible states that all the feasts of the Old Testament serve as a mirror and a shadow for the events to occur in the New Testament. Ultimately, it became distinctively evident throughout the life of Christ. The day after keeping the Passover, the Israelites left the land of Egypt and went through numerous hardships until they crossed the Red Sea. It represents the suffering, pain, and sacrifice that Jesus Christ would go through after keeping the Passover until He was crucified the following day. God allowed all these records to be written about 3,500 years ago. All the works of Christ that were shown to us serve as examples for us. Therefore, following His example, shouldn't we strive to live for the glory of God and for our beloved Zion family members? 2,000 years ago, Peter and the other disciples said, Lord, we will follow you even until death. They expressed such devotion to Jesus in times of peace. However, when faced with a situation where death was inevitable, they all fled. Even Peter, who claimed to have the strongest faith, denied Jesus three times. Jesus knew very well about their hearts and their faith in Him. Thus, didn't He tell them beforehand that they would deny and abandon Him? God knows better than anyone else how weak humans are. He knows that despite what lies in our hearts, our weaknesses will be revealed when faced with challenging situations. That is why he told Peter, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Jesus' disciples denied him. Judas Iscariot, who was one of the apostles, even betrayed him. Think about how he must have felt when his disciples deserted him and fled. The disciples should have been those whom he could rely on. They even professed their faith, saying, I will follow you even to death. He endured such pain on the inside. At the same time, he went through physical pain and suffering, countless ridicule and mockery from adversaries, and even the suffering on the cross. He went through a time when inner pain and outer pain intertwined, when suffering was continuously compounded. There are people who claim, I follow in the footsteps of Christ and the example of Christ, but halt their journey of faith when they encounter hardships while carrying out the gospel. Moreover, there are quite a few individuals who turn away from this path of faith that leads to the kingdom of heaven. This was the case during the time of the early church, and it remains true in this age as well. However, when we successfully overcome these tribulations, surely the crown of eternal glory in heaven will be granted to us, won't it? Doesn't the Feast of Unleavened Bread commemorate the suffering of Christ? God appointed the regulation of fasting on this feast. It is challenging for us to not eat anything until 3 p.m., within this regulation. Then let us take a moment to contemplate the life of Christ who endured severe flogging and even carried the cross up to Golgotha. We should contemplate why did God, who deserves the utmost honor, glory, 
exaltation and praise come all the way to this earth and live this kind of life. It was to save and redeem us sinners. It was entirely because of our sins and our transgressions. When we reflect on the fact that we place the burden of our sins upon Christ, we must strive to follow the life of Christ closely. We must ensure the safety and participation in the salvation of our Zion family members who have entered the truth but not yet have thrown away their ways of the world completely. It is our responsibility to continually guide them on the right path. We should not regard the Feast of Unleavened Bread merely as one of the feasts. We should be determined to change the way we live our life and follow the life of Christ and His example. Only then can we fully accomplish the true meaning of this feast that Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother have granted us. Then, let's open Leviticus chapter 23 and reflect on the meaning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the Old Testament. Let's turn to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 5. Let's take a look at chapter 23, verse 5. The Lord's Passover begins at twilight, on the fourteenth day of the first month. On the fifteenth day of that month, the Lord's festival of unleavened bread begins. For seven days, you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold the sacred assembly and do no regular work. As we can see, on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they were to eat bread made without yeast. The bread that they usually eat is soft and easy to digest. But during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, they eat bread without yeast and bitter herbs in order to remember the suffering. To understand the deeper meaning behind the establishment of this feast, let's take a look at Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 1, it is written, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near pi Hahiroth between Migdol and the sea. They are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite Baal Zephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds about them and said, What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 of the best chariots, along with all the other chariots of Egypt, with officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites, who were marching out boldly. The Egyptians, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near pi Hahiroth, opposite Baal Zephon. Verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you 
You need only to be still. The Israelites were pursued by the Egyptian army, and the pain and suffering persisted until they crossed the Red Sea. Amidst the divine majesty of God, who guided them by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, they were still afraid of the Egyptian army. In order for them never to forget the sufferings they went through until they crossed the Red Sea, God designated the annual feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On the 15th day of the first month, by the sacred calendar. We too should always engrave on our souls all the sufferings that Christ went through. We should remember them until the moment we enter spiritual Canaan, the eternal kingdom of heaven. We must never forget every aspect of suffering Christ went through after He kept the Passover. No matter what kind of hardships we face, we should never become discouraged and give up. We must learn the life of Christ through hardships we face. Living on this earth is truly challenging and daunting. Then how must Christ have felt when He carried the cross to save mankind? How must father have felt? How must mother have felt? We must always reflect on these thoughts as we endure and overcome our hardships. Let us examine a few instances Christ went through when He came to this earth 2,000 years ago in order to grant us salvation. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 23, verse 33. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. When we read Luke chapter 23, verse 33 through 39, we can see that all kinds of people mocked him, ridiculed him, and slandered him. These people did not hesitate to ridicule and mock Jesus in all kinds of ways. Even the robber on the left, who was crucified for his own heinous crimes, participated in the contemptuous act of mocking and ridiculing Jesus who was crucified without any sin. This scene depicts what our Heavenly Father experienced when He came to this earth 2,000 years ago in order to save us. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 62. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man 
sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah, who hit you. The mere creation committed these acts against God the Creator. They even shamelessly asked for the consequences of their sins to be returned to them and their children. Let's move on to chapter 27, verse 27. Let's see verse 27. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. We just read Luke chapter 23 and Matthew chapters 26 and 27. Even now, as we see all these records that only partially depict what Christ went through, how do you feel? Imagine if our physical father were suffering these things, although he is innocent. How would our hearts feel as his children? It would be truly an unbearable sight. If we were to witness such insults and humiliation right in front of us, we would be enraged. How can these things happen? However, Christ went through all these sufferings on our behalf due to the sins that we had committed. If we have realized this, we must ask ourselves, what should our mindset be while living our life today? That is why Jesus enlightened us that if we want to follow the life of Christ, we have to carry our own cross in this sinful world and follow Him. Jesus taught us that this is the way to return to the eternal kingdom of heaven. Let's move on to Matthew chapter 16. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple, whoever wants to follow Christ in order to enter the eternal kingdom of heaven, must deny themselves. They must deny their own pride and stubbornness and take up their cross and follow me. The cross here does not refer to the actual cross, but symbolizes suffering. Jesus said that we must take up this suffering and follow him. Let's see verse 25. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. Here in this verse, Christ instructs all the children of Zion, whoever wants to be my disciple and follow me must deny themselves, take up their cross, and then follow me. Therefore, we can conclude that the essence of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is to abandon all arrogant and prideful thoughts, carry our cross, and follow Christ wholeheartedly with the sole intention of saving mankind. All of these events that Father went through were accurately prophesied by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Ultimately, the root cause behind all these events that Father went through is us, His children. We must never forget this today. If we come to forget this, we might end up treating our brothers and sisters carelessly. And furthermore, we will even fail to obtain the faith required to completely follow the life of Christ and His example. Let us always remember the life of Christ. 
I hope that we will never forget the sacrifice of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, the path of suffering they have walked for us. Then, what should we learn from the sufferings within the life of Christ? Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's see 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. When we are under the pain of afflictions, hardships, and sufferings, we must think of God first. God endured even greater trials than what I am experiencing. He walked such a path on my behalf. In another version, it is written, If you think of God and bear the pain, this pleases God. Verse 20. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. Verse 21. To this you are called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. Christ set the example of suffering that you should follow in his steps. Let's see verse 22. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. In each process of guiding our brothers and sisters of Zion into the embrace of God, we must always remember how Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example, and follow in his steps. Only then can we save the souls of others. This is what Apostle Peter emphasizes in 1 Peter chapter 2. Therefore, in the New Testament times, God has granted us a time of fasting through this Feast of Unleavened Bread we keep today, so that we may not forget even a little of the life of Christ, but remember it all the more. Let's turn to Mark chapter 2. This may be a brief period of fasting, but many members still experience difficulty and pain during this time. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Here, his crucifixion is described as the day when the bridegroom will be taken away. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day, they will fast. In accordance with this teaching in the age of the Holy Spirit, we now commemorate the Feast of Unleavened Bread every year with fasting until the afternoon service, signifying that we participate, even in a small way, in the suffering of Christ. Fasting should not merely be a goal in itself. Instead, we should contemplate its meaning while fasting. After keeping the Passover, Christ did not sleep all night but prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, thinking of the suffering he was about to endure. The Bible records that his sweat was like drops of blood. Even just witnessing this scene, we can fathom how painful, heartbreaking, and difficult that moment must have been, can't we? After praying, when he came to the disciples, he found them all dozing off. Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. Imagine the loneliness he must have felt, coming to the disciples three times, 
and seeing them all sleeping. Considering just this single situation 2,000 years ago, there is no one who shared father's pain and anguish. Everyone deserted him and fled. In order to avoid the situation, they denied him. One of his disciples even betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. He went through a time of such immense loneliness. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? After waking his disciples, he went and prayed again. And when he came back, they were sleeping once more. This is what we are doing now. The pain and suffering of the cross were unbearable. Yet even in the life of Christ, there was not a single person who offered consolation or comfort, nor did anyone accompany him. It has been a long time of 2,000 years. The eternal kingdom of heaven is drawing much closer. The age of the Father and the age of the Son have passed. We are living in the age of the Holy Spirit. Reflecting on these events that happened in the past, all of us must willingly participate in Christ's suffering and follow in His steps. Let's find one more verse in 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 10. And the God of all grace, who called you to His eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will Himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. Amidst all the trials and hardships we encounter on this earth, we must never forget that there is always God's providence to solidify and strengthen our faith, making it firm and unwavering. Instead of merely trying to avoid these difficulties, we should be able to overcome hardships and triumph over them as God's children. Let us always think of God and overcome. God came all the way to this earth and endured all those things for the forgiveness of our sins. Compared to that, what I am going through is nothing. With the proper understanding of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, let us become heavenly children who can safely enter the eternal kingdom of heaven. By this, I would like to conclude today's sermon. Thank you very much.